I know that single women want to have a parade of men coming through the house. Exactly. I get that. Yes. Dump it. Marriage used to be the ultimate goal of boys and men. Because in the old days, it was the only way a guy could get what he really wanted from a girl. Today, men have the home court advantage, which has left you ladies with several different types of men. Hello, and welcome back to the Bogdanov Show, your source of brutal black pills. Today on the show, I'm going to cover the 2012 movie, Think Like a Man. Without further ado, let's get into the black pills. So according to this movie, men used to get married because that was the only way to get their hand in the cookie jar. But now that there is an overabundance of snatch, men have no reason to act right. The current dating market is nothing like this. You have 30% of males with waifus and hentai, the next 50% are normies who are ascending about as often as Jupiter is visible with the naked eye, and then you have a hookup culture for the top 20% of males. I suppose the women involved in this culture are all virtuous Proverbs 31 women who are looking Looking for a male that has his loins girded up with scripture. Anyway, let's see what these male archetypes are about. I mean, I don't even know where to start. You got the player? Hi, Ziki. You sexed it. Those aren't mine. Asshole. I am going to assume that the actor's age in this movie is canon for how old the characters are in the movie. If this is the case, Tyrone is around 40. Now, as a 40 year old Tyrone, he's basically playing the game on tutorial difficulty. It is way too easy to string along Foyts and pretend that he is interested in more than just stretching their rectums. Let me explain. If a 40 is in her 20s, she's going to like his disposable income and accumulated wealth, especially when contrasted with males in their 20s who are trying to get their careers off the ground. Remember that when she says she's into older guys, she doesn't mean a fat trucker with a receding hairline, a beer gut, and a plumber's crack that is longer than the Gaza Strip. She wants a male that's a genetic specimen, one that has all the advantages of an older guy with none of the detractors. An older dude is also the best way to act out because her private school education means she has to manufacture her own angst to piss her dad off. If the Ford is in her late 20s to early 30s and has kids, she's going to constantly have her head on the swivel for a stepdad for her bastard Tyrone spawns. Chances are that she would settle for a normie as a beta bucks, but what she really wants is a Tyrone. If she can lock down a Tyrone, she'll be happier than Jeffrey Epstein backstage on the set of Full House. You see, when Pookie sneaks in the back window of her dad's house, the only protection he has on him is a 40. So when he lights her block up and empties the clip, it's only a matter of time before she has just a few new wards of the state. And it's notoriously difficult for her to fill out a child support form when all she has is a nickname and a vague description that matches all 12 of the niggas sitting outside watching the Mari show at 11 a.m. instead of working. If the police could do something with that, Pookie would already be in the custody for the unsolved murder up the street instead of three houses down boning her on. So Bone Quisha has to do a vaginal steam, some kegels, and then head out to the dating market with a minivan full of jigaboos to try and source a homo erectus dumb enough to pay for somebody else's kids. The obvious start to this is to try and rope in a Tyrone with some low effort sexy times and then start asking for shekels when he gets comfortable. If the Ford is in her late 20s or early 30s and doesn't have kids, her biological clock is going to be ticking so loud that it's going to be audible to people beside her at the food stamp office. So she is going to be overclocking into maximum overdrive trying to find a dude that wants to settle down and utilize her uterus before her eggs become so powdered that every queef looks like Thanos snapping along to stand alive. If the Ford is postmenopausal, she's just going to want the dust knocked off of her pussy. She knows that she has nothing to offer a male other than no strings attached sex, so the concept of a slightly young a guy who can still catch an erection without a blue chew is going to be more useful than MacGyver with an iPhone. In all these scenarios, the player has an easily deployable strat. He just has to mind one in a long term relationship. They don't have to know that the Cadillac is double parked and still idling when he's knocking the boots. After he's done, he can drop the can line and then abscond. Wait a minute, I'm not done. You got the mama's boy. Happy Valentine's Day, sweetie. And you too, mom. <laughs> I feel like this archetype was just brought in for the memes. It doesn't make any fucking sense. The more realistic version of this archetype would be the broke nigga that still lives at home with his mother because he doesn't have two nickels to rub together, a pot to piss in, or a window to throw it out of. But so I quit my job. Yeah, I, I wanna be a chef. You wanted to be a paramedic, you wanted to be a PR agent, and now you wanna be a chef? 
Perhaps one of the only pithy points that Red Pilled Homie Wrecked I have made is that women don't want to cheer you on during the race, they want to wait at the finish line for the winner. The problem with this archetype isn't that this nigga has his head in the clouds, dreaming about finally doing what's right by his family and finishing high school. The problem is that all he has is all dream and no coin. The three careers he just described are all below the poverty line, so you better figure out how to be comfortable on a park bench covered in wet newspaper. Of course, Michael Ely is a known Tyrone that could have snuck into the big house and boned the plantation owner's daughter, and nine months later when she craps out a high yellow kid, the plantation owner would be more confused than the Ukrainian kid closing out Fortnite and still hearing automatic rifle fire. Baby, it's, it's, it's my dream. Really, Dominic? Because I wanted to be a ballerina and Janet Jackson when I was seven. The problem with this little vignette pointing to this Ford as an objective reality dweller is that nothing could be further from the truth. Every Ford in 2022 either has a podcast, is trying to blow up on TikTok, has an OnlyFans, or is in some way, shape, or form trying to transcend the concept of working for a living. This goes for me. All right, baby. Oh my god. I will, I will, I will, yeah. You will what? <laughs> This might be the worst casting I've ever seen. This white homo erectus is like 5 foot 3 while Gabrielle Union is like 5 8. In real life, she's married to a 6 foot 4 basketball Tyrone. Even Doctor Strange couldn't envision a world where she stoops to the level of this manlet who is so close to the ground he would be unharmed if a lawnmower ran over him. But in real life, the only males who are not settling down are the ones at the top who don't have any reason to buy the cow because they're getting the milk for free. In 2022, normies are lining up like Columbine to jump into relationships with Foyt's 2 to 3 points below their SMV because it's either that or buy a real doll. In reality, this white man lip would have less options than a fixed menu. At the end of the day, these archetypes all come secondary to what the respective looks of each guy is. If the player had true cell looks, the only thing he's going to be playing with is himself. If the dreamer looks like Black Ops 2 cell, he can only dream of a successful relationship between his neck and the rope. And if the non-committer is a sub-5 male, the only thing he's going to commit to is life when he kicks the stool out and his neck snaps. With best-selling author Steve Harvey. Well, what I try to get women to understand is that times have changed. Your playbook has Steve Starvey has made an entire career out of blowing so much smoke up women's asses that he could make 9-11 look like a science fair project. Step 1. Convince fat middle aged women that they are the prize that males are too immature to treasure. Step 2. Get them to tune into your daytime talk show where you tell them what they want to hear. Step 3. Step 4. Profit. The Steve Harvey show is basically just urban FDS. Women are victims, males are predators, and Wall Street bankers have tiny hats nestled in curly hair. Okay, maybe they're like... <coughs> Hello? What? I need to license the goofy sound from the last video. But I did that myself. You want me to do it now? <coughs> Yuck! <laughs> Gorge! Yeah, I'm not, I'm not married, so I'm not wearing a ring. You see Sadie over there trying to pull that PYT? I don't know what I did to make you so defensive. All I'm saying is something's changed. Usually, you know, there's an aura, there's a, there's a glint about you that I'm not seeing, and I don't know. Job-related, it's just... So in this scene, Happily Divorced tries to pull up on this black Becky the bar and gets shut down like the third line trying to sneak onto Noah's Ark. Then the player rolls up and starts nagging her like he's Homo Tomasi on a cold approach. Nagging is a lost art of paying backhanded compliments to a merc in hopes that they respond by chasing validation. What's idiotic about this approach is that it never began for Kevin Hart and his ability to gesture max. Hart is 5'2 and 90% of women said they would reject a guy at 5'4. Romney, on the other hand, is a Tyrone who is breaking out the entire PUA for Dummies manual to pull some void that's a five at best. Why the hell would he have to employ some galaxy brain reverse psychology strat when he could just likely walk up and then say, you want some fuck? On a logical level, nagging doesn't make any sense. For one, there has to be a steep gradient from the negger to the neggy. A sub-8 male could not attempt this because a Foyd isn't going to care about his opinion. A Chad or Tyrone could get away with this strategy maybe, but that's like putting meat tenderizer on a filet. Do you want the fucking pate? If Romney passed his Foyd's looks level, he doesn't need to soften up prior to approaching. If she was a 9 out of 10 Stacy, then perhaps he might go for the risky play since it's high risk, high reward. But when a Tyrone needs to overclock his CPU just to get it back into 
respond to his advances, you know that it's over. Have a good evening. Thank you. Got shot down. Wait. If Kevin Hart wasn't a blue-pilled homo erectus, he wouldn't be more confused than George Bush wondering why Flight 93 is landing in Pennsylvania instead of on the helipad for the World Trade Center. The whole reason why Tyrone's approach worked is because he's taller and better looking. It's that simple. I keep hooking up with guys who don't want a relationship. I know why you choose to have your little <clears throat> group therapy sessions in broad daylight. I know why you're afraid to go out at night. It's simple. We uh... stop hooking up. <laughs> <laughs> if it's so simple, why haven't you done it already? If you're good at something, never do it for free. Listen, men respect women who have standards. If this Ford had the ability to swear off that sweet Tyrone dick and be celibate until the homo erectus decided he wanted to commit, this movie would be shorter than Black History Month. Now, to wit, this Ford isn't hooking up with a Carlton on the first date. No, Carlton the Black Normie has to take on five dates, reveal his bait statements, and sign a binding contract with arbitration before he can get a Christian side hug. Meanwhile, two seconds after Carlton drops her off, she's dialing up Tyrone to come turn her sponge cake into a Twinkie. So now, Queasers at a crossroads. Tyrone is one call away from icing her little Debbie, but he's about as consistent as the random number generator. Carlton will clear his schedule for the next 60 months so they can max out his credit card at her favorite steakhouse, but she doesn't want to put Carlton's meat in her mouth. This advice is about as useful as putting on a ballistic vest when you're downrange of a predator missile. With regards to men liking women who have standards, there's a small grain of truth to this, but only a normie is going to hoodwink himself by saying the past is in the past when he proposes to the town bicycle that everybody is taking for a spin around the block. If Tyrone commits, it's not going to be to a Ford that would look like a Jackson Pollock painting under a black light. At the end of the day, Bunquish is as much a slave to the free market economy as anyone else. Netflix tried to hike up their prices and wound up having their stock tanked by $50 billion in one fucking day. She can adopt a gold standard, but when her past is involved endlessly printing greenbacks, her valuation is going to drop when compared to other currencies. This is simple math. Steve, I'm a partner in my law firm. I own my own home, but I've been single for three years. Why can't I seem to find a man to live up to my standards? Hey, I just got my license. Hey, I'm getting my neck. Hey, I doubt it. Okay. Ah yes, the Ford who thinks she has it all together. She's a partner at a law firm, she makes six figures, and she owns her own house. She's a strong, independent woman. Why can't she find a man that wants to be half of a power couple? The brutal black pill of the successful Ford is that she essentially prizes herself out of the dating market by sheer virtue of her own hypergamy. Let me explain. First off, we've already established that a male has to pass the basic looks level if Ford finds necessary to date before any of the supporting cast becomes relevant. So she is looking for an attractive guy who owns his own home, makes over six figures himself, and has a high profile job. The question then becomes, what sort of Ford is that guy looking for? None of this bullshit that she just rattled off makes her any more attractive to a male. She looks like she's 35 going on 50. She looks like the reanimated ghost of Harriet Tubman and any Tyrone with similar stats has no interest in her underground railroad. The crux of her SMV is dictated by how attractive she is, not how many shekels she is making or whether she owns her own home. Any male with an iota of intelligence quotient is going to understand that he is not going to have access to her money, so how much she makes is irrelevant. If she is 35 years old, she has a limited fertility window, and the likelihood of her throwing away her high profile career to queef out a few jigaboos before she hits menopause is slim. To make matters worse, you can hear the haughtiness in her voice like she's entitled to a man because she's successful. A successful Tyrone is not going to want to share the spotlight with her. He wants a Ford that's going to be meek, give him some kids, and slurp his sausage. Not some high profile Aaron Brockovich in blackface who thinks she's too intelligent to go stupid on the dick. But the most glaring problem is that a Tyrone making good Good money would be able to attract a Foy that is 10 years younger than she is. This Foy pissed away her fertility window by building up her personal stats, but none of these stats makes her more attractive to a male. Is she under the false impression that she can spend her peak SMV years hedging bets for herself and then some giga Tyrone is going to pull up like Pampers in the 11th hour and sweep her off her swollen feet? Bullshit. He's going to be heading down to the restaurant and snapping up the waitress with the perkier tits and the bigger ass. Hi Steve, um, I'm currently dating and I just want to know when is the right time for me to introduce my man to my kid. Look, Aunt Jemima here needs to shut the hell up asking questions. Any homo erectus that she's dating better double wrap his jimmy unless he wants to catch diabetes and whatever endocrine disorder Sharkeisha here has. So Wide Load here didn't have on ad block when Tyrone decided to coat her coochie in his fairy dust. So now she's wondering at what point does she introduce her jigaboo to his future stepdad. A single mom is never going to be in control of what Tyrone does. Carlton is more than happy to say the past in the past 
past and assume the world of the dead who stepped up, but he's only doing that because he doesn't have any other fucking options. Problem is, Sharkeisha doesn't want Carlton, she wants Tyrone, and Tyrone is off planet saving the galaxy, which means Normie's gonna be rotating around her like a Rolodex, clapping her cheeks and putting dent in the head of the kid that she's currently pregnant with. You hate to see it. Hey, did you bring any chance to go to Fairfax High? Yes. I went there as well. Sorry, I don't recognize you. Got the glasses and the buck teeth. Oh, look, could we go grab a cup of coffee or something? We could maybe catch up on old times we never had. Well, I have a son. This is fucking brutal. Ten years ago in high school when this Floyd was at the peak of her SMV, Lil Bow Wow had a crush on her, but because he had glasses and an overbite that could crack open a turtle shell, he was about as valuable as a pet rat during the Black Plague. So ten years later, he tries to spit game at this Floyd based upon previously having a crush on her. Now that he has higher SMV and looks like he has a couple of shekels at his disposal, she is now amenable to being approached. But wait, now she has one of Tyrone's dingleberries hanging off of her ass, nerfing her SMV, and she looks like she aged 20 years in the last. 10. The second this homo erectus heard that she had a kid, he should have clutched gold in the 100 yard dash. He should have peeled off so fast that he could pass Usain Bolt like a blunt. Instead, he offers to buy dinner for this void to fit her schedule. Is this really the best he can do? Let's just run through all the black pills of dating a single mom. Number 1. Since Bonequisha is a single mom, she likely has a low tier job. Most men to high tier jobs require either schooling or putting in long hours of work, neither of which Bonequisha has at her disposal. So Lil Bow Wow is going to need to make 3-4 to four times what she makes for her to even consider dating him. When she's living in a ratty one bedroom apartment in the projects living off of Wick and food stamps, Bonequisha thinks she deserves better for her and her bastard kid. But it wasn't like she asked Tyrone for a QRD on his financial state before he emptied his clip in her and then peeled off before the spin shells could even hit the mattress. Number Number two, Bonquisha is probably tired of the pump and dump, and Normie sees her out in the wild with her bastard child, pegs her for the low hanging fruit that she is, and then pulls up as if he's going to commit and then punts her away like his fourth and twenty after he blows her back out. But she's tired of going down to the market to buy baby formula when she's still covered in baby formula from the night before. So her solution to this problem is to tell any homo erectus that's trying to date her that she wants to wait to hit the horse on ye. This is a dual main strategy. She a security child from a Tyrone that would never settle down with her, so now she has to link up with a beta bucks who's going to finance the kid and buy his huggies. Now, if she can find a homie erectus that she's actually attracted to that is willing to take up the mental of stepdad, that's the aspiration. But the chances are a Tyrone of this caliber has better options, so the next best thing is a beta bucks with the bankroll. Now, third, because Lil Bow Wow actually has a job and his address is in a P.O. box at Pelican Bay, Bonquisha is actually going to be hitting the W key for it. Whenever she does let Lil Bow Wow at the birth canal that's already been stretched by Tyrone and his bastard kid, she's going to be telling Bow Wow to empty the clip into her. Because if Bow Wow is stupid enough to open up the Trojan horse and let all the Greeks spill out into the city, he's going to be financially fleeced for the next eight years. Child support is a percentage of your legal income, and since the IRS doesn't know about Tyrone moving bricks and slinging dope, his income is whatever money his mama puts on his books so he can get some snacks from the commissary, but Bow Wow gets a W-2 with his government name on it and he doesn't consistently pay his child support, he'll get thrown in jail or he'll get passed around like communion on Easter Sunday. So Bonequisha is either going to be angling for a kid which is 18 years of paid rent or a marriage. That way if Bow Wow decides to take the black pill and pull out like he was stationed in Afghanistan, she will split his wig and his wallet. Number 4. Tyrone's demon spawn is going to come first, Bonequisha is going to come second, the ratchet and the roaches and the project department is going to be third and somewhere between my IQ and Mount Everest's height in millimeters as Lil Bow Wow, and if Tyrone ever gets out of Alcatraz, he's going to be spending his short sabbatical on the outside clapping her cheeks, but, you know, he had a crush on her in high school, so... Also, side note, this actor is 42 fucking years old in this movie, why the fuck is Lil Bow Wow looking like he's 30? Why the fuck would they cast this boomer of a Floyd across from a nigga that could literally be her fucking son? Unreal. So... I think that's enough black folks for the day. In the end, everyone gets some blue pill fairy ending, the males all start simping, the foids are in control, you hate to see it. Until I catch you in the next video, keep the rope out of reach. Bog out.